Hi, my name is Dan, and today I wanted to talk about ketamine and esketamine for the treatment of depression. There's been a lot of buzz around this topic recently, so I really wanted to dive deep into some of the evidence and some of the potential mechanisms and talk about why this is so exciting and so many people are talking about ketamine's use. There's a few reasons why ketamine is causing all this buzz. One is that its mechanism is so much different than other antidepressant medications, so it's not working directly on serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine like a lot of other antidepressant medications do. So it's opening up a potential new pathway that can help in the treatment of depression. There's some other reasons why it's causing some buzz as well. Another is that it seems to work much more quickly. So one of the issues with a lot of current antidepressant medications is that they take a month, sometimes two months, to exert their full effect, whereas ketamine is showing effects the same day, the next day. It's showing instant, well not instant, but a lot quicker effects for depression. And then a third reason of why it's causing so much buzz is there's some evidence that's showing that it's decreasing suicidality in these depressed patients. Um, a lot of medications don't seem to have that effect. There's no true antidepressant medication that seems to have that effect. There's some evidence that lithium, uh, often used in bipolar, decreases suicidality, and some evidence that an antipsychotic medication called clozapine can increase, or sorry, decrease suicidality. So ketamine might fall in that area as well. Ketamine was first synthesized in 1956. It has uses in veterinary medicine and in people. It was first studied in people at the University of Michigan, and it was used as a general anesthetic medication, so a medication that basically puts people out for surgery and other procedures. There is an S and an R isomer of ketamine, and the isomers are basically like mirror image chemicals of each other with little differences. Ketamine's being studied for depression, and so is S-ketamine, the S-isomer is being studied for use in depression. Ketamine works differently than other antidepressant medications in that it doesn't have that direct effect on serotonin, norepinephrine, or dopamine. Ketamine works on a different pathway. In the brain, there's a primary excitatory pathway called the glutamate system, and glutamate causes brain cells to fire more often to talk with each other, as opposed to the opposite of that is the GABA system or the GABAergic system, and that causes brain cells to fire less often, to communicate less with each other. And ketamine works on the glutamate system. There's some subtypes and subsets of glutamate, one being NMDA and one being AMPA, and ketamine works on both of those. So ketamine is an NMDA antagonist, so it blocks the effects of NMDA channels and increases the effect at AMPA channels. And then what AMPA does is causes a rapid um, change in BDNF, which is brain-derived neurotropic factor, which is, you can think of it similarly to a fertilizer for brain cells. So it causes the brain cells to be able to connect to each other much quickly and it, it builds those connections and it, um, ketamine also works on mTOR, M-T-O-R, which is another pathway that causes that rapid connection between brain cells. This seems to potentially have the most effect in the prefrontal cortex, so the front, the front part of the brain, and that's associated with advanced planning and cognition and potentially mood and depression as well. So to boil it down as much as I can, ketamine is potentially causing these rapid um, growths between brain cells and key areas of the brain so they can communicate a little better and help to, and it seems that it helps to treat depression in that way. Route of administration is also being explored with ketamine. So it can be taken orally, it can be taken through an intranasal spray, and it can be taken IV. Um, just like all medications, if something's taken orally, it goes through something called first-pass metabolism. So before it reaches the bloodstream, it goes through the liver first, and the liver makes sure that nothing toxic gets into the body and metabolizes a lot of substances. So when it's taken orally, 
ketamine has less bioavailability, which means there's less ketamine that's able to make it into the system and bind to where it needs to bind. Whereas when something's taken IV in the veins, it's 100% bioavailable. Everything that goes into the bloodstream has the potential to bind to its receptor in ketamine's case. Intranasal falls in between, so it uses the mucous membrane in the nose to be absorbed into the bloodstream, whereas IV is directly into the bloodstream. So the time that it would onset is a little delayed with intranasal administration. Ketamine ca can cause some side effects like all medications can. It can increase heart rate, it can increase blood pressure, and it can even cause heart palpitations, so some serious side effects. It doesn't cause respiratory depression though, like the opioid pain medications do, or like benzodiazepine anti-anxiety medications do. One of the most well-known side effects or subset of side effects with ketamine is the dissociative side effects. So it's sometimes abused or used as a party drug or used illicitly, and it's used due to the side effects of causing um, some hallucinations and some dissociation and some depersonalization or the loss of self. I've been reading a lot of the evidence behind ketamine and S-ketamine in the treatment of depression, so I wanted to talk about some of the trials that I was reading. The first trial that I looked at had 73 patients and it compared ketamine to IV midazolam, which is a benzodiazepine anesthetic medication. And the reason that they chose this as the comparator was because if you gave someone ketamine versus placebo, you would they would know what group they were in. Because if you got the ketamine group, you might have some of that dissociation or some of those side effects whereas in the placebo group, you hopefully shouldn't feel any of that. So they use the midazolam as an active comparator because the benzodiazepine is gonna cause some sedation and, ca and cause some effects. So it would be harder to, for the patient to know what group they were in. And what they looked at was the Madras depression scale, and they found that the ketamine group's Madras depression scale score decreased by eight points more than the midazolam group. And what they found was a 64% response rate in the ketamine group as compared to a 28% response rate in the midazolam group. So they were showing much higher response to the IV ketamine. The next study that I read looked at IV S ketamine, so just the S isomer of ketamine versus placebo. So the patients probably were able to tell what group they were in but they also looked at two different doses of the S-ketamine, so they were trying to see what dose would potentially be better. What they found in this trial was in the lower dose group, the Madras depression score dropped by 16.8, in the higher group by 16.9, in the, in the placebo group 3.8. So they were showing much higher, massive um, depression score decreases in the active group compared to the placebo group. The next study that I looked at compared intranasal S-ketamine, so compared to the first two trials that were both IV, now this trial looked at intranasal and looked at S-ketamine as an adjunctive treatment in treatment-resistant depression. So these patients were also on more standard antidepressant medication therapy. The study also looked at differing doses, so S-ketamine could be used twice a week, 28 milligrams, 56 milligrams, 84 milligrams, or placebo. Again, changes in the Madras depression score was assessed, and what they found, the S-ketamine 28 milligram group decreased the score by 4.2, 56 milligrams by 6.3, 84 milligrams by 9.0, which were all stronger than the placebo. And as you see, these scores were less significant than some of the IV trials, but these patients were classified as treatment-resistant depression and were on active medications, other medications, so that could play a role in why the scores were decreased by less. Another trial looked at intranasal S-ketamine for depression and also for suicidality, and the patients were assessed at four hours, at 24 hours, and then on day 25. And what this trial showed 
was for the depression scores, there was significantly better scores at hour four, at hour 24, but not at day 25. So there might have not been as lasting as of an effect. And for the suicidality side, there was significant improvements at hour four, but not at hour 24 or at day 25. So the suicidality benefit was much shorter lived, just shown at that four hour mark and then not at the next mark that they looked at. Another trial looked at IV ketamine for treatment resistant depression, again with suicidality. So this was the point that I wanted to include this trial in because it was looking at suicidality again. And they used a specific subset of the Madras score to find a suicidality or suicidal ideation score that was from zero to six points. And what they showed was a single infusion of IV ketamine decreased the score by an average of 2.08 points 24 hours after. So that study I was just talking about did not show the effects at 24 hours. In this study, the IV ketamine did show the effects at 24 hours. 62% of the patients had a great response with their scores being zero to one post infusion. 23 endorsed fleeting suicidal thoughts, so still had some suicidal thoughts, while 15% continued to have high suicidal scores. So this trial showed a little bit longer acting effects with the IV ketamine, and 63, or sorry, 62% did, did well with the treatment. The final two trials that I wanted to talk about were oral ketamine because there are limitations with IV, especially because you would most likely have to go to a hospital to receive that, whereas the intranasal would be a little easier to administer at home, but oral is the most common for medications and would be the easiest. So there, are, uh, there is a little bit of data for oral ketamine for the treatment of depression. The first trial that I was looking at was out of Canada with 22 pa patients with treatment-resistant depression and that was defined as they tried and failed three regular oral antidepressant medications. And in this case, they actually also failed transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is a different type of um, treatment for depression. What they showed in this trial was only 18% of patients showed a 50% reduction in the Beck depression inventory. So basically an 18% uh, response rate, which isn't that good. 14% had partial improvement, 45%, so almost half had no response, and 23% got worse. So this trial was showing in real life experience with real life treatment resistant depression patients, oral ketamine did not seem to show much improvement. I did find an additional trial for oral ketamine in the treatment of depression. This was in hospice patients, so patients that were in end of life care and there were only 14 in this trial. They showed that the patients did respond in the anxiety and depression scales that they were using, but only eight, eight patients out of the 14 completed the trial, and four of the patients dropped out for not having a response to the ketamine. So the oral ketamine, again, was showing potentially some response, but four patients did drop out because they weren't having an effect. So there's still, there's still more evidence that I want to see before I make a complete decision on ketamine because there's a lot of variables. One of the variables being route of administration. So what's best? Oral potentially doesn't seem to be the best. Is intranasal S-ketamine as good as IV ketamine treatments? There's also potentially some variables in dose. What's the best dose that's available? And then a third is time frame. So we're seeing some of these effects like suicidality at four hours in one study, at 24 hours in the next study, and then not, not potentially not past that. And is that clinically significant? Maybe, but if the patient is coming in for the ketamine administration, they would already be in the hospital. And at that point, they would be mostly safe from um, attempting self-harm or committing suicide. So there's some more variables that I want to see, especially that I want to see ironed out, especially with duration or time frame. Does this work for treatment depress resistant depression for a long term, or are the studies only showing these quick, quick bursts that are improving mood, but then not lasting at uh, 
not lasting at a month or two months or three months or down the road because depression seems to be at this point a long-term disease state so if it only helps for a month and it only helps suicidality for a few hours is that really going to change a ton it has the potential to and i'm excited to read more evidence as the evidence comes out but right now i still want to see like i said some of these variables ironed out i think i am still mostly optimistic though because one of the things that does excite me about the ketamine is that it's a completely different potential mechanism in treating depression so many of the other treatments focus on um, certain tr neurotransmitters and this one's taking a different route with the glutamate pathway and blocking NMDA and affecting AMPA so it's working differently which I find exciting they did some trials with other NMDA antagonists that have not shown the antidepressant effects so there's something more with ketamine whether it be the AMPA or whether it be a different downstream effect that we don't know about that's differentiating ketamine for the treatment of depression so there's still a lot I want to learn about ketamine, but because I was reviewing all this evidence, I wanted to talk about it for a little bit. So I hope this information was helpful. Um, I hope going over the evidence was helpful, and I'm excited for the future of ketamine for the treatment of depression. Thank you for listening.